2, starting or just using the verse 7 to go right into what God, I feel, has put on my heart to share with you. Genesis 2, verse 7, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. We have looked at the image of the church portrayed to us as a body with all its parts. Paul talks especially about that. We can quickly relate to it. It makes sense. It is a real inspirational analogy to also practically apply it to the life as a church. Everyone has a part. We are not the same. We are all different, but somehow we all belong together and the body and its parts really only make sense if they actually can do something. A lot of parts were needed to just pick up that uh, uh, microphone right now, right? So uh, many are involved to, to do and to apply the ministry of God that God has assigned us to. We also were given the example of a building to understand church better with Jesus the cornerstone and the leaders of the church as foundational blocks who rest on this cornerstone and into whom all other living stones are fitted in in order to form this wonderful special house. It is a spiritual house. The Bible compares this building not made out of stone and wood but of many different living stones with the house that God instructed to be built in the Old Testament in the times of Solomon. It is compared with the temple of God. But what is with this temple with all its different living stones what is so significant so that it would be a sacred building. Or if we talk about the body as the analogy of the church, what is missing of all the parts are already finally aligned together and then held together with all muscles, nerves, flesh and skin. You might think that is an odd kind of analogy. Bones fitted together and then wrapped in muscles, nerves, flesh and skin. Well. We actually discover the Word of God when it uses this kind of, kind of image in order to speak to His people through the prophet of God. And also for the very reason to find out what was missing and what is needed. And what He, our God, had in mind to accomplish with those the Word was addressed to. But then also we, we can understand today. He had us also in mind as we gather here to become this house of God. That is what I believe. And I want to read these words from Ezekiel 37 for some familiar words, for some new. The hand of the Lord was on me and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones. And say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tenants to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. 
I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Significant this proclamation, especially the last sentence. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise. A rattling sound. And the bones came together, bone by bone. Bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Important. Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breathed, well, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army of all things, an army. Why not a village? Or a community, a nice gathering, a worshiping, celebrating fellowship, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel, the people of God. They say, Our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. You, my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. In other words, I will bring you back to your destination. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you, and then you will live. And I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. What a show. A valley of bones spread out. They had been there for quite some time because they were all very dry. Not dry, very dry. But they were there. The Lord giving the, the, prophet's instru the prophet instruction and God's people a promise that he would bring them back to life as a nation, as one people. Yes, that is actually what was missing. Life. It is possible that the people of God fall into a sleepy mode. As if they were not alive anymore but dead. They belong to God, no question. But they over time can decay into dry bones. Very dry bones. Another translation expresses it this way. They were pile, there were piles of bones everywhere in the valley. Dry bones left unburied. I thought about it. Piles of bones. As if a pile of bones, I say, represents a church. That had ceased to be alive. Is that possible? 
Is that biblical? Oh yeah, it actually is. Paul writes to the Christians in Corinth, for those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why among you are weak, many are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. Another term for are already dead. Dry bones. So we see that a New Testament church had experienced a development of, yeah, expiry. Slow death, if you will. They had over some time discontinued to acknowledge, appreciate the body of Christ, the church, that is the people of God gathered together, saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ, forming a family that exists to bring glory to God and mercy and grace to people if the individual still was a lively part of it or not, if the body of Christ was still healthy throughout or not. They did not have any awareness of that anymore. It was not much of interest to them any longer, so they were slowly fading away as a church. Fellowship, friendship, family of believers, slowly fading away. Have you ever noticed that when you think of a church? That was a rhetorical question. I think many of us even have a church in mind when we think about that. Some are already dead. Others so far only weak and sick. But it seems also that they were about to die as well. I'm not sure if that really referred to a physical death or just dying from the inside, spiritually. We are not clearly taught about that by Paul. Jesus also talks about one church in Revelation through St. John, pointing out that they had a serious, serious problem and it seemed that it somehow had not been really obvious to them. To the angel of the church in Zardes I write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God. Powerfully important. Because this is a term used for the Holy Spirit. He who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have an appearance, a reputation of being alive. But you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Powerfully important. It's even explained why they were slowly dying. Because the work that they were assigned to do was unfinished in the sight of God. Not done. Well, we did good so far, didn't we? Yeah, but it's not finished yet. But all our effort does not count that for the years that 
we're kind of not so alive? No. It doesn't count. Not at all. No. Because those who will last to the end will be crowned. Who are faithful until seeing Jesus face to face, they will be crowned. Clear to see that they were not aware of the spiritual stage they were in, and so Jesus had to wake them up. We are quickly sidetracked to just see the accusation in this text. But we don't see the grace in this text. Do you see the grace in this text? They didn't know that they were dead. So Jesus comes and wakes them up. Do you see the grace in this text? Wake up. Thank you for waking me up. I would have been too late to, for work. And then I would have lost my job. Is that good that I was woken up? Yes. Oh, I don't like... Hey. Who, okay. Like, all oh, right. I know. Detour. Not... Who is in for the ice bucket challenge? Come on. Who is in for the ice bucket challenge? Ah, you did it. Excellent. You know, I'm... I'm I, I, I talked about this to myself, right? And I thought, okay, well, I'll explain it to you in a minute what it is. Of you who don't know what it is. I thought, hmm, hundreds of thousands of people do the ice bucket challenge for ALS. That is a disease. Uh, it's, it's, uh, an athlete was affected by it. And a friend of his colleague started this challenge of pouring a bucket full of ice cubes over himself and, and then donating to the charity to find a cure for this disease. And then he challenged four others to do the same. Of course, not to forget to donate something, right? The ice bucket itself is not the big deal, right? Ah, uh, yeah. So it is about <laughs> getting your wallet out and putting some in there, right? So otherwise, it's just the awareness and not really a cure. But hey, it triggered within days. Thousands of people did the ice bucket challenge for ALS. I didn't even know that there was ALS before. And now we know. And Every time they do this silly thing, I always, like, I don't know why, but I kind of, I, I don't like, just gather some inside of human response to cold water and ice cubes in it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 And all the other voices you can imagine, right? So everyone responds differently. They are so cool before it happens. I challenge, blah, 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 blah. And then, whoop, whoop. <laughs> the ice comes on their head. Okay. It's not a good feeling if somebody wakes us up with cold water while we are asleep. And we scream him up. How dare you waking me up? And uh, I think we are all not completely free from being angry by sudden wake-up calls. It was mentioned yesterday in the wedding as well. As a, like, if you want to have a good marriage, don't wake the bride up suddenly. And if you do, don't talk to her one hour or something, I don't know what it was. We all can relate to that, can we not? 
Yeah, that's uh, actually a good advice. Jesus dares to wake up that is about to die and offends the church severely with an accusation they were not prepared to receive. You are dead. How dare he say this? Let's kill the prophets as they have done in the Old Testament. All of them. Why? Because they did the wake up calls for God. And they were probably too close to the response of the people. And the wrath of the people killed them. Jesus talks about it. You, you have killed the prophets. Because they told you the truth. You made them silent. I don't want to hear from God. I want comfort and sweet talk. But please don't wake me up, especially not when I'm in church. You have a reputation being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. When the piles of bones in the vision of Ezekiel were finally all fitted together, covered with flesh and skill, skin, they probably already looked pretty good and even real. But it was quickly noticed by the prophet that even though they looked as if they were alive, they actually were still lifeless. Why? Because so it is written, there was no breath in them. So the word of God came to the prophet again. Say, prophesy. What does that mean? Speak to life. Speak to life. And the word of God will come, not return, what? Void. It will actually fulfill what it was sent to do. Prophesy. To the bones to become alive. To whom? What exactly was prophesied and who actually was commanded through prophecy? Prophesy to the breath. Come. Come breath. Come breath from the four winds. Again, clearly an analogy for the Holy Spirit who covers all the earth with his awareness, with his seven unending senses and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied, the prophet continues to report and he commanded me and Breath entered them. They came to life. And a sign that they came to life was they actually stood on their feet. They were not sitting anymore. They stood on their feet. The first response to having the breath of God in their bones is to stand up. I don't like standing up. That's okay. I don't like these kind of forms. That's okay. You don't have to. And you shouldn't. But that's what the Holy Spirit caused in them. To go stand on their feet. Serving 
in synergy. Being one army. Come back to life. Like the formed body at creation. Formed out of earth. Clay. It was made alive by God breathing his breath into them. Who was breathing? Were they breathing? They couldn't. They couldn't. At the beginning of time. So the once very dry bones came back to life after being fitted together and prophesied over the breath of life came and breathed life into them. And so I see in this for a church that has already experienced decay and some very dry bones are giving proof of it or churches that may be never experienced real life I see a great promise awaiting to be fulfilled hello it's not a judgment it's a promise it's a vision for future not a condemnation for death. That's exactly what has to be changed. Death needs to be defeated. And life needs to happen. There's nothing we can do. No lifeless body can do unless the Holy Spirit, the breath of life, is commanded to breathe into its dry bones into all its parts and members, all its bricks and blocks, then no longer death, but alive. Like a bo body becoming a living being, now finally being able to live to the honor and glory of the one who ordained life to come and raise him from the death. Yes, we need structure, we need gifts, we need purpose, but most of all, we need divine breath for all of us to be a church. Otherwise, we are not. Well, we are, but we're dead. Holy Spirit, come! Church, only a living organism and not just an organization. If she, the church, is able to breathe the breath of life in and out, and in and out, and in and out. Do you get the picture? This is something that continues on and not just happened once. Not at the revival stage, but to be alive continuously, in and out. <sighs> Breath of God. Making alive what is not yet alive. Bringing heavenly oxygen to every part to every member, if there's oxygen missing in one of your parts, it's dead, even though it's still on the body. It's dangerous too, for the whole body. Serving in synergy. And what is the true what is true for the organism church, it is also true for every individual life here. What is true for the church as an organism is also true for every individual life here.
did breath of heaven come in? Are you already alive? Each one of us, we all are in need to be made alive in order not to not only be beings made out of dry bones, we, every one of us need to receive life in order to feel, in order to be alive. John says, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but Spirit gives birth to Spirit. Breath gives birth to breath. Ah. You should not be surprised. At my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound. You cannot tell where it comes from and where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Or born through the breath of of life from God. We don't know exactly where this heavenly wind is blowing. We don't understand the whole concept. But we see that Jesus says to the Pharisee, you must be born again. There is the call to open up and not to just let it happen or not. You must be born again. And if you want to maybe say that only very quiet so that nobody hears it, I must be born again. I must be born again. I must be made alive by the breath of heaven. Prophesy to come into me and bring me to life. Everyone is called. How does this happen? Where does the wind blow? Are you open? You want to receive? Maybe not for a rebirth. <laughs> but you might need to be revived. Come back to life. Come back to life today. Paul met a couple of disciples, actually more than a couple, as we soon see. And up after observing them for a little bit, he kind of says, because he was suspicious, he said, <clears throat> I just can't place it. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you first believed? That was kind of, it felt kind of, can't explain it, but it's as if they're, they're not really alive. There's something missing. It's not really real. It looks good, they're nice, they're awesome. 
wonderful people. Paul loved to talk to them. But listen, did you receive a new life? Did you receive the breath of heaven when you first believed? I said, no, we have no idea. Is there, what's the Holy Spirit? What is this? And then he asked if they had been baptized. Did you present yourself to live for Jesus Christ and Him alone from this day forward to all eternity? Baptism, the public proclamation, I belong to Jesus. You must be born again. Did you do that? Oh, he just had this John baptism. Well, that is not Jesus' baptism. Because Jesus' baptism does not ask you to come back again and again. And again and again. Because John the Baptist's baptism was a baptism that was always repeated. Because of the sin that came up again. It was a baptism to wash away sin before Jesus came. And the next day they were sinful again. They went back to the Jordan and were washed again. But Jesus' baptism is an entrance to the kingdom complete. What you have stated in your heart, when you call them the name of the Lord, you also confessed, witnessing publicly, I belong to Jesus. I die to the old and live forever for Him. Once and for all. Not repeat it. So they got the baptism, they were in. And then when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came to them. The breath of life came to them. And they were never the same again. Instantly, they spoke in tongues and prophesied. They were about 12 men in all. That's nice. 12 people. Wow. 12 men, not just dry bones any longer, but breathed on with breath of life the Holy Spirit, now finally being made alive and immediately being used as a powerful, life-giving source, letting the Holy Spirit flow through them to others by prophesying the life from God, they themselves were sources. They started to prophesy. How about you? Prophecy means speaking life to others. Speaking truth of God into reality. Making a life. And I feel God impressed me with this word because we talk about church and about a healthy church with true discipleship without being odd and weird and cultic but completely there open to be used God impressed me to to prophesy over you this morning over all of you I know that sounds weird right now over all of you who are not yet sitting here. I'll explain it one day better. But I believe that when God inspires to speak, it doesn't matter how many people are there. Because when the word is spoken... It will not return void, but it will do 
what it was told to do, even if nobody else is in the room. That's my conviction. And sometimes it is training for me to be faithful to God. I told you about preaching to one person in Erfurt. An older man, you know the story, some of you. It was a new church plan. Liz was there, I was there. We had six children. And then there was this man. And it was me. And we had in our downstairs living room was our church. And on the other side of the church was our cafe. And upstairs in the attic was the kids' church. And Liz, after worship time, took the six kids. It was an interesting worship because nobody knows the songs, right? New church. Those people were never in church before. It was very interesting uh, to just sing to the Lord. <laughs> and then I, I say to the man, is, your, is it okay if I preach to you? I kind of was, you know, I just wanted to just, I had a good word and I just wanted to give it all. And, and he said, yeah, I like that, I like that. Poor man was already older and he was on medication. So he had trouble to stay awake. And so I started preaching. And it didn't take long that he actually just dozed off on me. <laughs> okay, well, I preach louder. Whew. There he is. And he struggled with his challenge of staying awake. And uh, then he was just gone again. And uh, I thought I'd try that again. The next sentence with a loud voice. And he was there again. And that repeated itself until he did not really respond to my loud voice anymore. <laughs> like a loud TV you have on all night because he couldn't fall asleep. And it just nobody noticed. Uh, not the one sleeping. Except the whole house, right? Kind of like, what's going on here? And then I stopped preaching for a couple minutes. I just never was I focused on the congregation as on that day. <gasps> All of a sudden he was awake. Something was missing. My soothing sound of the voice was missing. And he woke up again. And we made it through the end of the service. And finally Liz came back down with the kids. And we could do, go to the cafe and have a nice fellowship time. Hallelujah. We made it. In those days, I felt as if God is just testing me to the bones. I had been a pastor before the church with over 100 members. And it was thriving and growing. And lots of people being saved. And now I was in nowhere land. Preaching to the one falling asleep. But I felt in my heart I have to continue on just doing what I do without ceasing. Just do it. Speak words. It will not return void. It will not. But it's not your reward and your business, it's mine. Just do what I tell you. Just command my spirit to come. And I will do what I want to do. Today, the church has over 200 people coming on a Sunday in a communistic area of Germany. I didn't know that word has power. I didn't know that word has life when the spirit comes and changes and does things that I do not see in my, with my eyes. And I hear the reports and I'm just so grateful for the things that God has done. I'm not rewarded for that. I, that is my reward. 
I can see it from far. What God has done because He's true to His words. It's not about me. Who cares about Marcus? What about the Word of God? Speaking life prophetically. God is speaking life this morning to those who are not here. You need to speak life to those who are still dead in your family. Speak life. Let the Holy Spirit inspire you be a prophet like none before. Speak it out when nobody's there. Just speak it out. God will make sure that His word will not return void. And even if you're not here anymore, He will do it. He will do it because He promised to. This is a promise, not a condemnation. We speak life. And God will do what he, I need Him to speak. I just need Him to speak. Let us pray. Lord, come and speak. Speak, breath of life. Come and come. Lord, I need you so much. I need you, Lord. Come in your Holy Spirit and birth life, Lord. What I cannot do, you are able to. And that is what you have already sovereignly assigned, Lord. That you will send your word and you will heal the land. You have said it, Lord, and you will do it. I just submit to you today. I just ask, come breath of life. I command you to come. I command your Holy Spirit to come and bring life in Jesus' name. Come now, come now and bring life to this dry bones. And we say this in Jesus' name. We unite our hearts. We are, we are impressed by your presence. We are impressed by what you are able to do even when it seems to be dry and dead, all of a sudden you show up and life happens. In Jesus' name, life will happen. And life is happening at this time, even in those who are not here. I believe, and I say it in faith, your Holy Spirit will wake us up and will bring a new a, a new era of life church with multiple signs of wonders of rebirth of people coming back to life who were not yet buried with dry bones but just laying there not gone. There's promise. There's hope. It will happen. And we say in faith, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.